All righty. And I'll um, thank you again, everyone, for attending this evening's um, session on um, boxes in South Sydney. Um, I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us this evening. My name is Emma and I work for the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Um, I've got a background in vertebrae pest uh, research and more recently I've been supporting communities in using the feral scan resource and connecting people to, people to best practice uh, pest animal uh, resources and offering training um, to local communities, both online and face-to-face -face, um, around reporting of pest animals, um, best practice pest animal management, et cetera. Tonight, we're very lucky. We've got three, um, three presentations and the webinar will be recorded so that you can um, uh, have a look at those presentations again at a later date and share with your local community. Um, and I'll also send out some um, additional fox management resources and some contact details um, in case you have further questions uh, following this evening's um, session. We've also got a, a short feedback form. So at the end of the session, I'll pop that in the um, chat box. Um, but if for any reason you are unable to fill the um, form out this evening, um, then I'll also put that in the email for tomorrow. But um, yeah, it's only short and it'd be really good to hear um, your feedback. Um, on the event and about box management in your region. Um, our first presenter this evening is Alison Cowlton. And Alison works for Greater Sydney Local Land Services as the Monitoring, Evaluation and Reporting Officer. She's been working on community pest animal programs across the region, and she studied um, the ecology and management of foxes in the Gnu Forest near Dubbo in New South Wales um, to support the efforts to conserve the Mallee fowl population in the area. So Alison's got a very deep knowledge in, um, in this um, topic. Our next presenter is Brendan Le Levitt. Um, Brendan is a conservation land manager based in Southwest Sydney, who is uh, representing the Menangle Fox Control Campaign as the Pest Animal Community Group Coordinator. His role within the campaign is to link local landholders together, provide training, assist on group control measures and to coordinate control efforts to achieve best results across a broad landscape. Brendan will be providing an overview of the Menangle Fox Control campaign, including the four cluster control groups that have been formed surrounding it. And finally, you, uh, you will receive a presentation from myself um, and that will be uh, focusing on the feral scan resource, um, most importantly, the fox scan resource within feral scan, um, how to use this resource and how it might benefit your local community. Before we get going, I've just got a few housekeeping um, slides, so I'll share screen with you briefly. I'll just double check that everyone's on mute as well, just for a second. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. bring this up. So this is just um, in case you're a little bit unfamiliar with um, the Zoom software, as I know that we've all had multiple different um, softwares over the course of um, COVID. Um, but tonight we've got everyone on mute, um, but we'd love to hear um, your comments um, and questions. So if you're using a desktop computer or a laptop, um, you can click the chat button to open up the side panel that's down the bottom and you can type your questions in the chat box. We will try to address um, the questions at the end of the session, but if, um, if some questions are a little bit out of scope or if we run out of time, um, then we'll try to address these in follow-up um, emails to you all. To change your screen view, um, you can click the view button up the top right-hand side uh, and then select speaker. If you're using a mobile device, you can swipe your screen either left or right to change the speaker view. If you're still on your mobile device, down the bottom left-hand side, you can select start video if you wanna turn your video on and off. Um, and if you click the three buttons or the menu bar, that will open up an option where you can type in the chat. 
So I will hand over to Alison now, who will take us through um, some general um, fox biology and fox management. Thanks very much, Alison. Oh, you're just on mute too, Alison. Okay, thanks Emma and yeah, th thanks everyone for, for joining in tonight and for uh, yeah, taking the time out to look at uh, foxes and their impacts and some of the control methods. So <clears throat> as Emma mentioned, it's I guess we're looking at fox control in urban areas tonight and uh, how what we can do to, um, to help uh, reduce those impacts. But first of all, I thought we'd go through some of the biology and some interesting things about the, the fox. So some of you may know foxes were introduced to Australia um, in the 1870s for the purposes of recreational hunting. Uh, they sp spread quickly across the continent, uh, reaching uh, West Australia by 1914. So yeah, that was um, some, a lot of distance uh, covered in across that time period. Um, a number of years ago, it was estimated that foxes cost the environment and the economy more than $200 million um, in control and um, losses to you know, livestock such as lambs, etc. And a pest control order for foxes uh, was recently gazetted in New South Wales, making them a declared pest to be controlled. Um, foxes um, have an average of four um, cubs per year, so they're they reproduce only once a year, but they can have up to 10 uh, cubs. So they mate in winter, the cubs are born in spring, they're red in summer and they disperse in autumn. <clears throat> so densities in urban areas have been recorded as high as 16 per square kilometre from a study done in Melbourne a while back, but that's thought to be um, yeah, similar for Sydney as well. So the densities are actually higher in urban areas. They may, in those areas, they can have a home range of 30 hectares, uh, but in semi-rural areas, they can you know, be as large as 200, 300 hectares and further west, they can you know, be thousands of hectares in areas where the resources are low. They can travel around 10 kilometers a night. So that's within their home range. So if they have a small home range, they may, they may you know, travel a lot further um, or many you know, cross, over the same area many times in a night, whereas in a, a larger home range, they may cover a larger area, but just traveling around um, once through certain parts of that range. And they can disperse around 40 kilometers outside that range area. And it's been known, um, some dispersals have been yeah, hundreds of kilometers. <clears throat> so as we all probably know, foxes are very smart, very cunning. Um, I'll, play us the sound that they make, which you may have heard before. Uh, this is a bit quiet, but hopefully you can hear it. Okay, sorry, that only played once. I'll try that again. You can hear me in the background but it's a it's quite a different call call to a dog um, and yeah during winter especially you may hear, come across that sound um, fox diet so you can see from this chart put together from um, a colleague put this together from a number of studies but it just shows you how varied their diet is from uh, you know reptiles birds mammals insects plants and then you know Items of clothing um, have been found. Obviously, pet food is a big, a big one as well, and then rats and mice and some other other mammals. So, yeah, the foxes <clears throat> are omnivores, eating plants, animals, and often, yeah, the insects do make up a large part of their diet. Um, foxes generally need about 300 to 400 grams of food per day. So, we just put together this slide to show if, for example. Foxes were only eating common ringtail possums, which of course is very unlikely, but a common ringtail possum weighs uh, about 800, 860 grams. So a fox would consume, say perhaps half 
uh, ringtail possum a day, but that turns into say 182 per year. And if you had four to 16 foxes per square kilometre in a peri-urban to urban area, say for example, Camden, uh, LGA is 201 kilometres squared, then that could be 800 to 3,000 foxes in Camden, and they could consume potentially 400 to 1,500 possums per day, which could turn into 146,000 to half a million per year. So I guess even a conservative 10% estimate of that would be 40 to 150 possums per day, 14,000 per year. So of course, this isn't, you know, this is probably an unrealistic um, uh, way to look at what uh, they're eating because they wouldn't eat just the possums per day, but it tells you that you know, they do require a lot of um, uh, potentially native animals uh, to yeah, survive. And this is just a, a video of a fox consuming a ringtail possum in an underpass up in the Blue Mountains. Uh, this video is interesting because it shows you the um, I don't know, the audacity of the fox, like the, the fact that it's facing a, a swamp wallaby. I mean, potentially this swamp wallaby may have been just hit by a car and it's sort of or stunned or something, but it was trying to yeah, get away. But you can see how strong the fox is to get that swamp wallaby down and to actually drag it across the road. In this situation, um, <clears throat> I think there was uh, a car coming and as you can see, he actually runs off from the swamp wallaby away but it just shows you how strong they really are again they are. Um, foxes are known to be good climbers which is often a surprise to many people um, you can see here this was a study done by some people at Sydney Uni I think foxes in trees uh, are they a threat for arboreal fauna so they were doing a study on watering points for koalas but they actually yeah, got some footage of a fox <laughs> reaching that same area in that tree that you can see marked there and yeah, there's um, this is a fox in the um, Wallandilly area that's climbing a tree. I think there's a hollow just a bit further up that it was using, which is quite remarkable. Um, foxes are also known to get into houses and cause havoc. As you can see, this poor fellow has found himself in a bad spot. But yeah, just their ability to climb, it's, it's almost like they're more like cats in some ways than dogs. Um, and yeah, I think this might have actually been in England somewhere. <coughs> um, and you can see here too, there's been um, incidences where um, this uh, fox got into a young girl's um, bedroom and uh, yeah, caused some grief as well. Um, now this, this is a video I'll just show, um, turn on, it takes a couple of minutes, but um, it, just shows you again how these people are actually trying to control foxes using fox whistles and <clears throat> yeah, the, the gameness of, of foxes. Recently, my son Brock and myself went out to check out a new property. Upon arrival at the front gate, we noticed a nice little area we thought was worth a whistle. Uh, even though we were in close proximity to a major highway where we knew we couldn't shoot, we thought it was worth a try. And to our surprise, two came a-running on the first whistle. So this is a common method used to bring in foxes. The first fox came in from the left and trotted up a fence line, hoping whatever was making all the fuss was on his side of the fence, and it wasn't. He refused to cross as the lower wires were electrified, and that's where he stayed. The second fox came in very fast from the right and knew exactly what he was after, wanting to take the silver fox whistle directly from my mouth. Well, it was the first time for everything. I was actually filming a fox out in the front of here on the flat and all of a sudden I caught the glimpse of something to my right coming in hard and fast. All of a sudden it disappeared off the screen of the little camera here, but luckily my son was just over at that tree there and he filmed the whole thing. 
So we've uh, put it up for your enjoyment. So yeah, that, I guess that just shows you a bit about the um, the um, behaviours of foxes and uh, how cautious they are, how smart they are, and how game they are. Um, so now, I guess just we've talked about some of the reasons of why to control foxes. Um, so we know that they play a major role in the decline and extinction of Australian species. Uh, there's been a lot of species over the last uh, 100 years or so that have um, declined because of the, the predation by foxes. Uh, they, as we've mentioned, a significant economic loss to producers, um, you know, in the lambing industry and kid goats and poultry as well. And they do carry uh, diseases such as rabies. Um, if sorry, if that was if rabies was to reach Australia, um, the foxes would be a vector um, of that disease that would we would have to really try and manage. And they also spread diseases such as yeah, you know, cyclops, mange, etc. To humans, pets, livestock, as well as native animals. So how do we control foxes in urban areas? Um, that's a good question because um, even though 1080 poisoning is the most effective and efficient way to manage foxes, it's um, not uh, uh, possible in a lot of the urban areas because of the uh, impacts on potentially on domestic animals. And Brendan will go into that a bit later. So the shooting again, not really possible in some of the urban areas. I know some councils uh, do use that method in reserves um, very carefully, obviously. So we, we're going to look at um, fox traps uh, shortly, but we'll just also look at other ways of uh, control. So simple tips to reduce the fox problem. Uh, things like don't leave pet food outside overnight and never feed foxes. So we've, we've had um, calls uh, from um, residents that know that you know they have neighbours that feed the foxes and the populations can get quite large when you've got some residents that do feed foxes. Uh, they, it's a good idea to use enclosed compost bins, keep domestic animals secure at night, remove fallen fruit and fruit trees from the fruit trees, uh, keep garbage bins covered, um, consider the entry points to drains, close, close off access to underneath buildings, use fox proof enclosures for poultry, turning off outside lights that might attract insects, reducing weeds that provide food and shelter, such as African olive and blackberries, and don't feed uh, native wildlife as well as they become more vulnerable to predators. <clears throat> so one of the biggest things is the pet food out at night. And yeah, it's a really good idea to, to try and um, manage um, that access to foxes of, of pet food outside. So other control methods might include exclusion fencing. So you might know Australian Wildlife Conservancy, for example, as and other um, agencies like that have, have used fencing to fence off very large areas of, of forest to protect native species. Guardian animals um, for livestock, such as alpacas, et cetera, have, and um, marema dogs is widely used. Den fumigation. Uh, that's using carbon monoxide to fumigate the uh, foxes while they're in the den. Ground shooting where applicable trapping, uh, predator lighting can be used to, to scare off foxes. Uh, fox proof enclosures, again for poultry, very important, even having a cover on the top of your poultry shed because foxes are such good climbers. Um, 1080 baiting where applicable and canid pest ejectors as well that deliver the, the, the baits. Um, so as mentioned, um, cage trapping can be a, a lot of work, but Brendan will go more into that um, shortly. So as Emma will mention too, recording observations and control activities and damage in Fox Scan is extremely important to the program. <clears throat> um, local land services also um, provides training in um, Fox trapping and yeah, that can often when a, a group gets together, um, we can uh, organise a day, a workshop where you, you learn more about fox biology and how to trap the animals. So yeah, just to end on, there's just a few photos here from some of our monitoring that um, shows when we're when we're trying to manage foxes, we do pick up a lot of other species, and these are the important species that we're trying to protect. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Emma.
Thank you, Alison. That was really interesting. And those videos are just incredible. Um, I also have a question, but I will save it to the end. Um, I think we should bring Brendan on next and have a look at um, a local example of um, how people can work together to help manage um, foxes. Um, can I pass that over to you, Brendan? Oh, need to unmute you. Sorry. Let's try that. Hello. Not working. Oh, perfect. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. Welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in on this um, chilly Wednesday night if you're in Sydney. Uh, my name is Brendan Laveau. I'm the Community Pest Animal Coordinator um, with uh, Barrigal Land Care and Local Land Services, uh, Greater Sydney. And um, yeah, I'm here tonight to talk to you about a uh, successful control program that we had uh, titled the Menangle Fox Campaign. Uh, I guess the most important thing about the campaign is um, if you notice up in the, the top uh, right-hand corner of your screen, just the amount of uh, stakeholders involved with this project. You know, you've got people from state government, local councils, um, local community members, land care groups, um, a really broad-ranging um, amount of people to make this thing possible. I'm just going to hide that and away we go. So uh, Barrigal Land Care Group, um, they're, they're a fantastic uh, land care group that work out of the Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute in uh, Menangle, which is just sort of uh, southwest of Campbelltown. Um, and they had a really great vision and that was to create a woodland corridor from Mount Annan to Razorback Range. So if you're not familiar with the area, the Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute sort of sits in between Mount Annan and Razorback Range. The Barrigal Land Care Group had done some amazing work on the property to date, uh, including uh, revegetation of uh, native woodland, as you can see here of the uh, native plants going in. They had undertaken a lot of work within the riparian areas. You can see this area to your left, the before photos quite heavily impacted from uh, compaction from cattle and a fair bit of erosion going on. And I guess that's the after photo to your right where you can see the native vegetation coming back and um, all that, that uh, erosion has been taken care of. Um, some fantastic work controlling a really invasive woody species, which is African olive. Uh, you can see the top is the before and the below is the after. So all that African olive has been removed. They've done a lot of work uh, with aquatic weeds also, trying to improve the wetland systems there for our native water birds. And I guess this is the real amazing thing about MAI is that um, it's home to a lot of large, big, old remnant trees. You can see this one here on the left, um, aptly named Mr. Fat. Uh, it's a eucalyptus botryoi, a native uh, eucalypt. And on the right is some of the fauna that this thing is um, hiding, which is the little forest bat. So I guess from around about 2014, they'd noticed that, you know, we're doing some great work here with all of our weed control, but we're not noticing all that many animals around to enjoy the native woodland that we've um, assisted in regenerating. <clears throat> so what happened was a bio blitz was undertaken uh, where a whole bunch of professionals uh, and non-professionals, volunteers got involved and went through the property over the course of a few days and surveyed for all different types of fauna and flora. So looking at birds, looking at native um, wildlife and 
what they found was I uh, whoop, sorry about that. Whoop, oh, how do we go back? Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, slideshow from current. Yeah, so what they found was um, a whole ton of uh, invasive foxes on the property and not much else. So nothing within the sort of critical weight category for native wildlife, which is about zero to two kilos. So all of your tiny um, ground dwelling mammals and ground dwelling birds were missing from that landscape. But what we have is a ton of foxes. So the Barrigal Land Care Group sought to seek funding and support from different institutions. And I guess they acted as the conduit between them all to make this thing a reality and to make it work. So they involved their Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute Management, um, who also helped in facilitating uh, funding through Commonwealth Land Care Grants. The New South Wales Environmental Trust also helped with funding and Greater Sydney LLS as well as facilitating the project. So you can see here that EMAI sits somewhere around here in these areas in between where these linkages could go. This is all the native vegetation that's left, the Cumberland Plain woodland, which is highly endangered, <clears throat> which brought them around to the Menangle Fox campaign. They thought, you know what, we can't do this alone. We need to have a lot of involvement and we need to get our neighbours involved to help us out also. So the Menangle Fox campaign was born and some of the key aims of it was to restore functioning ecosystems. So ones that were uh, full of native wildlife, but also native fauna, so our native animals. Um, they wanted to reduce the predation of livestock and also the native fauna. But EMAI is a working um, farm, so lots of their livestock gets taken each year. So they wanted to reduce that. They wanted to reduce the spread of disease. So up to your top right, you can see sarcoptic wombat mange has really taken a hold of this native wombat. And that is spread around by foxes to visit their burrows and interact with these wombats. And also they wanted to see the recovery of the declining ground dwelling species. So that bird there, that's the speckled warbler. Uh, probably one of its last strongholds within the Sydney region is out in the southwest of Sydney. Throughout the Sydney basin, they've pretty much become locally extinct. So very important to try and look after these guys. They also, being a land care group and focused on weed control, wanted to stop the spread of further weeds. Now, foxes love to spread African olive. It's one of their favourite foods during winter when food is scarce, and they'll often consume the berries of the African olive, and they'll poop it out all over the place. You can see the scats there down below, and they're just full of either African olive seeds or fur, presumably of our native species but could also be some rabbits and things in there as well so the group attracted some funding through the national land care program and this program aimed to provide 1080 pin down training uh, to community members uh, provide the baits to the landholders also loan wildlife cameras to landholders utilize wildlife cameras to monitor fox activity conduct community workshops loan cage traps and encourage the use of fox scan to record fox sightings. Following on from this funding, the group also attracted more uh, money through the New South Wales Environmental Trust Grant. And so what the group was noticing is that on the outskirts of their control area, there was getting a lot of interest from community members that wanted to join in and also control foxes. So they needed to identify those cluster groups of landholders and try and extend that program throughout those groups. So the aim was to purchase more cameras, traps and CPEs, CPE standing for Canid Pest Ejector, which I'll go into later. Uh, and the funds also sought to employ a project manager and a contractor to coordinate these cluster groups. 
The aim with controlling uh, foxes was to do it twice a year, uh, particularly when we're baiting, and we want to focus on autumn and spring because that's the optimal times to be doing it. But we also want to cage trap all year round and also utilise the other methods such as deterrence. Um, and we also wanted to install monitoring activities across the landscape. So not only uh, with mapping with Fox scan, but also setting up a whole bunch of cameras across the landscape, to see and measure the success of the control program. The funding also enabled uh, the group to fund some research. So uh, the University of Sydney, the Royal Botanic Gardens Animal Ecology Lab all came on board to figure out, you know, maybe we can uh, crack into where these foxes are moving throughout the day, where their den sites might be, to try and understand a bit more about their ecology in Sydney, because that will help us to control them. So this study looked at where do the foxes lay up during the day or night and what features they were using, you know, because traditionally foxes are, you know, uh, in a den, but, you know, in Australia, we might find them under rock ledges or in tree hollows. And so that was what this study was aiming to find. The study managed to geotag or geocollar uh, a couple of foxes here uh, with GPS trackers, and you can see their movements throughout the landscape there. So you can see that they do get around um, the males and the females. So yeah, tricky one to try and get a hold of. So where in Sydney, <coughs> should we place urban um, canid pest ejectors? So this was another study that came out of the funding through local land services, Macquarie Uni, the University of Sydney, and the Marine Predator Research Group. So the Macquarie University Fox Research aimed to look at genetics to see how the foxes are moving around through the landscape and also to examine stomach contents. Uh, so that we can get a gauge on what sort of prey they're chasing uh, throughout Western Sydney. So there's some great research papers there if you want to check them out after the uh, conference. <clears throat> and it sort of brings me into the, um, the plan as well, because uh, I was successful in um, being selected as that contractor, uh, Brendan LaFoe. So I own a company, uh, with a partner of mine, Jason Tell, uh, Out the Back Gate Productions and Wild Side Australia, and we focus on um, educating uh, local communities about the environment. And so this was just right up our alley. Um, so really stoked to be a part of this program. Uh, the role of the Community Pest Animal Coordinator, uh, my job, is to upskill community members through training, uh, facilitating uh, workshops, um, schools education, so you can see the, um, the photo here with the uh, school students uh, that had a cracker of a day at that school. Um, provide traps and cameras to local community, assist with on ground control efforts, help out with euthanasia and also I guess be the conduit to link community members to coordinate control efforts because the whole idea is that if we're controlling on one property we need to be controlling foxes on multiple properties. And it's a matter of engaging with your um, neighbours and bringing them on board because if we're going to have any success in controlling foxes, it's going to be across a broader landscape. So I guess there was two main sort of avenues that we took with the program uh, in upskilling the community, um, both through cage trapping and uh, 1080 um, baiting. So I guess a bit of an overview about cage trapping um, in terms of a control effort. What you want to do is check out um, a great video by Mark Lamb on um, training in cage trapping. Uh, you want to free feed the foxes prior to setting the trap. Um, you want to bed the trap in securely. Uh, you want to be checking the trap every 24 hours and you also, the most, probably the most important thing is you want to have a euthanasia plan because uh, there's nothing worse than getting a fox in a trap and then not knowing what to do with it. So you always want to have that done first. 
And before you go out and do any case trapping, I highly recommend checking out the PestSmart website um, and looking at the standard operating procedures for the trapping of foxes using case traps. Fantastic information there, and I'll make sure you're not breaking any rules along the way. So I guess this is just a screenshot here of Mark's YouTube video. There's a link up there that I'm happy to share after uh, training. So watch this cage trapping video. Uh, it's a ripper and it's full of great information. When you're setting a trap, you want to do some free feeding first. Um, it's always helpful. So you want to be utilizing things uh, from in the fox's environment, um, wherever you're seeing it, whatever you think it may be feeding on. I've had call outs to foxes uh, that were, you know, sticking around in people's backyards and they were just, um, they were feeding on their trash. And then what they were doing is they were caching the food. So caching means they were just storing it for later. And these people were finding that in their rubbish bin, after it had been ransacked, all of the food scraps were gone. And then in their pot plants on their veranda, the fox had digging it up and then buried it. So, you know, what we aimed to do there was let's get that that stuff, the food scraps, and we'll use that as the lure for the trap, and it worked. So you've got to pick things specific to the environment. There's a whole range of um, different ones here that are listed, such as chicken necks and chicken hearts and bones and pork bones and so on. Uh, what I have found is that foxes absolutely love the Colonel's secret herbs and spices, so KFC. So usually I do the um, run in there and get the, um, the double up zinger box. I'll have the zinger and the foxes can have the chicken and away we go. So when you've got a trap out and you've got it set, as you can see in the photo here, you want to be monitoring it. So you want to set up a motion sensing camera right near the trap just so you can see what's happening because sometimes you might think that you're not having any luck at all in catching a fox and that the fox has moved on, but it may just be that that fox is wary and it's just waiting there and it's hanging out, waiting to go into the trap, but it might not be too sure. So then that will help you to identify, well, maybe we need to do some things to the trap or change up the bait and then we might get that fox. Monitoring also helps you to recognise what other species are in the area. So as pictured here, this is a, um, bare nosed wombat in uh, Picton, so southwest Sydney. Uh, and there's the cage trap there. This bugger managed to wreck two traps in that exact location. Uh, so, you know, maybe if you've got some nuisance native wildlife there, you might want to think about moving the trap. So it's just handy to know what's coming in and going from your trap. So through the program with the Menangle Fox Control Campaign, we managed to identify a number of cluster groups outside of the control area. So the initial area is there, uh, it's in the orange box, um, and then surrounding it was a whole heap of community interest. And I mean, we're getting, yeah, lots of interest from even further abroad, uh, but unfortunately we've got to call it somewhere. So we managed to set up four cluster groups surrounding it. So that was uh, Wedderburn, uh, Picton, Razorback and Cobbity, um, all with lots of success and a lot of community participation. So this is just a snapshot from around 2020. Um, and we'd only just sort of been going for a little while and it was just starting to amp up. But yeah, a one month snapshot in autumn. Um, traps in Cobbity, there were seven and we managed to uh, capture six foxes. Uh, traps in St. Helens Park, one, and um, one fox trapped. Traps in Wedderburn, uh, three, and one fox trapped. So you've got to remember that's just a snapshot. Uh, as the program's evolved and more participation, uh, we've managed to get lots more traps out into the field. We've probably got between like 30 or 40 traps out, and we're getting a lot of foxes through. Um, so I guess I thought I'd just share a few case studies here. So this is uh, trapping in an urban setting. And you can see how close the houses are that we've got these traps. Uh, this was actually in a street where there was a problem fox. Um, we kept getting calls from a resident and 
this fox is really wreaking havoc on her and her partner and her children's lifestyle. So they were telling us things like the kids were riding down the street on their scooters, you know, having a packet of chips, and a fox would run up and grab those Doritos straight out of their hand, you know. Another occasion, uh, the husband had come home late from work and he had his takeaway dinner in his hands as he got out of the car and a fox jumped up and nabbed it. So that's how brazen these things were. And it became a real issue and they were really concerned for their safety. So we set up a lot of traps in the street and we managed to capture quite a few foxes. So there's one there in the trap. And then we left the same bedding in the trap and bang, the next night we got another one in there. It did take a little while to get these foxes used to the trap and the surroundings and actually managing to go in. So we were lucky. But once we got one, they just kept on coming. There's another one. I think we managed to pull about five out of that trap. If we go back to the school's workshops that we're doing and educating the youngins about uh, the damages the foxes do to our environment and economy, um, we managed to get the students uh, to create information posters. And in the process of doing that, one of the students actually revealed to me that they had been feeding foxes in their garage and they sort of had a family unit in there, uh, but they had slowly been disappearing. It was in the local area where these problem foxes were and she ended up revealing that it was only a street away that where they lived. So, you know, it sort of goes hand in hand. If you want to feed these foxes, uh, that's the sort of damage they're going to be doing. They become brazen and they start attacking uh, small children and adults for food. Uh, I chucked this case study in there because it shows, you know, a bit of a comparison as to why uh, foxes impact on people. So this was from a very prominent house in Camden and the family that lived there um, loved their gardens. And, you know, the bloke, he'd be out there every Sunday afternoon meticulously managing his roses. And one thing that really got to him was when the foxes would flick the mulch all over his manicured paths and eat his roses. So we were out to um, trap this fox. I set him up with a, a, a trapping and a euthanasia plan. So once the idea was once he caught a fox in a trap, uh, he would transport that fox to a local vet for euthanasia. Um, so we were lucky that we had that vet on board with the program. And it's just, yeah, it's a great great way to um, assist with the euthanasia plan. So we set that trap up and we got this fox in it not long after. We used the good old KFC bait in there. Uh, we moved the trap and got another one in there uh, the next night. And so this trap was, yeah, there was a little walkway that ran through that hedgerow behind. So once you get a fox in a trap, they're usually quite timid. Um, it's actually really surprising. Um, really easy to move and handle. Uh, you just want to make sure you're wearing your PPE and you want to cover that trap up. So the last thing we want to do um, is actually cause that animal any stress. They may be a pest species, but we still want to treat them ethically. Uh, so we don't want to stress them out too much. This one here was another scenario. This was in St. Helens Park in Campbelltown. Uh, we had a resident there that um, was getting frustrated. You know, they live right next to a um, reserve and foxes were coming up and they were grabbing the shoes off the front veranda and all the neighbor's shoes and they were just becoming a real nuisance. They were running these shoes all over the streets. And one, one um, neighbor there managed to just chuck a trap out the front yard you know, this is just along the Colourbond fence. You can see the wheelie bin there. And, yeah, bang, bang, bang. He, over a few months, he caught about six or more foxes in that trap. And, again, yeah, really successful. When we're looking at areas that are a bit larger than an urban property, um, we can look at different methods. So he got a larger cage trap. Um, and, yeah, same deal. We get them out there. The next... Um, Control method is 1080 baiting. Uh, basically, as an overview, it's a must that you complete the online training. Uh, you can turn up for face-to-face -face training when they're held for canine pest ejectors. Um, you need to undertake risk assessments with the assistance 
benefits of local land services. Uh, you need to provide notifications, monitoring. Uh, you need to check these stations daily and keep really good records where feral scan and fox scan comes in handy. Uh, so, yeah, basically online training, you jump on there and you do your course and um, it enables you to utilise 1080 and Pindone. Um, once we do that, this is just an example of a property and um, local land services will come out and do a risk assessment on that property. And you can see here, um, all those areas highlighted in blue are no-go zones for baits because there's um, minimum distance restrictions from housing and dwellings. Uh, so yeah, really trying to lower that hazard and that risk through doing really thorough assessments of a site. You need to post out notifications uh, to all your neighbours. You need to put adverts in the paper advising and you also need to install signage uh, on all the entrances and along fence lines, uh, notifying people that there is baits laid on the property. I prefer to utilise canine pest detectors because they're really target specific. So coming from a conservation background, I really don't want to see any of our native wildlife hurt uh, in the process. So I utilise the CPEs and you can see here the capsules that the 1080 uh, is installed within. Um, these basically get banged into the ground. It takes a fox, a lot of yanking. It needs one to two kilos of uh, pressure pulling upwards on that to make it fire the pin into that capsule to release the 1080 into the environment. So it's really contained and really safe. Um, that just gets a lure put on. There you can see a bit of chicken thigh around the um, capsule. Also want to put up monitoring cameras, very important, just the same as cage trapping. I always monitor if I see any signs of native wildlife or someone's pet dog in the area, I'll just abandon the program and won't go with it. This camera actually picked up this fox. It was, um, yeah, the canid uh, pest ejector, the 1080 bait is right center of the screen and the fox found a young Eastern Wallaroo uh, to be much more tastier and took off with him, unfortunately. Uh, and this is the end result. So the, the lure is gone and the, the pin is fired and released the, um, the 1080. So I've just got a quick video here of a fox actually activating it. So you can sniff it out. Noise, noise gone mad. And bang, he's just administered the capsule. Pin is fired and he's already had the dose of uh, 1080. And now he's going to attempt to gorge himself on the lure, which is either a pretty high chance that it's going to be a piece of the Colonel's finest KFC. And there you can see, sitting there, happy as anything. You can see the CPE just below, right about here. And he's just munching away on the lure. Not a care in the world. Beautiful sunset. And here he is wandering off. Yeah, he's happy as he's had a nice feed. And I guess that brings me to the conclusion. Happy to uh, stick around and answer any questions that anyone might have. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks very much, Brendan. You, Emma. I'll just get you to stop screen sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Did that do it? Yep, it certainly did. Right. So um, I will just quickly run through a few slides that I have on the um, Feral Scan resource. I'm aware of the time, so I won't take up too much of your time. Um, but uh, Feral Scan, um, uh, is a resource where people can record a lot of um, pest animal species, including um, foxes, um, and helps communities work together and get an understanding of what's happening in the local area, and also to communicate uh, what issues are happening in the local area. So why people use feral scan? Well, we've seen um, a lot of um, reasons why, the impacts that they have on our native wildlife and to the agricultural industry as well. But what is Feral Scan used for? So it acts as a monitoring tool. So it helps um, 
individuals and community groups um, get an understanding of um, fox activity, uh, places where foxes are, are frequenting, um, what they might be eating, etc. Um, and it helps communities come together and plan how best to manage foxes in the local area. Because as we've heard tonight, it's always best to um, uh, think about broad scale planning. So get um, together with your neighbours, um, have a chat about the issues and um, how you might go ahead in man managing um, those local issues and what might be best for your local area. Um, it helps you to record um, what you're seeing in the local area, communicate that um, with other groups and other people in your local um, area as well. Um, and also to record um, your efforts in controlling foxes as well. This is just a um, snapshot of foxes in South Sydney. Um, and this is what's been reported through um, Fox Scan over the last sort of 10 years. Um, as you can see, and as we've heard tonight, there's um, uh, quite a, um, quite a few um, foxes getting around um, urban and peri-urban spaces. Um, and these records are also indicative of where people were seeing them. So I'm sure that there'd be more foxes, um, for example, in the Royal National Park and around the Holsworthy um, area there. Um, but uh, this is a community resource. So it's um, re records for where uh, members of the um, community are seeing these individuals. So Feral Scan or Fox Scan um, uh, exists as a website and a mobile app. It's easy and free um, and you can download it on your Apple or Android device. The types of information you can record include sightings and evidence, so that might be scats um, or maybe wildlife camera images or perhaps you might see a fox on your morning walk. Uh, the damage and impacts caused by uh, foxes. So are they um, trying to take off with your KFC when you get home from work? Um, and certainly any control activities um, that you might be undertaking. We keep um, information in Feral Scan really, really private and confidential. Um, so any control information that you put into the system is never, ever released um, to the general public. This is a screenshot of the Fox Scan homepage. I highly encourage you to jump on um, after this session or maybe tomorrow and just spend a couple of minutes browsing through um, the website. We've got plenty of resources um, on there in terms of fox management um, and we've got some instructions on how to use the resource as well. Um, so please jump on and have a bit of a look. At the top right hand side, you can click on the map of Australia to start recording information about foxes in your local area or you can click the um, links if you would like to download, whoops, download the, um, the app on your mobile device. If you do choose to record information via the websites, it's very easy and simple. So you click on the map, um, click on record data at the top left, and that'll open up a form. You simply fill out the, um, the little form, click on the map where you saw the, um, where your FOX record is uh, located and then click submit. And of course you can um, upload some uh, images, whether that's taken on your phone or if you do happen to have a wildlife camera and, um, set up, you can um, attach images um, to your record. If you're using the app, it's so simple and easy. I'm not great with technology and I can do it. <laughs> Um, the um, app uses your mobile phone uh, internal GPS. So it registers your exact location um, at that point in time. All you need to do is select fox, the record type. So for example, I've just seen a fox. I fill in the form and then I hit submit. Uh, so there's literally four steps to um, submit a record on your mobile device. You have the option to display this record as public or private if you're entering a sighting or a damage, remembering of course that all control records are always kept private. So if you are entering a um, record of a fox, uh, say a fox sighting for example, that information will go onto the community map 
And depending on um, our VIPs in the local area, so for example, your local government or um, professional pest controllers, local land services, those people will have special access um, to that information. And that's really important because those, um, those type of um, groups can um, sometimes help um, plan for um, fox control in the local area. So it's really important that this information's pulled together in the one spot so that when broad scale um, uh, control activities are planned and undertaken, um, that information is easily accessible. So it's really important, not only for you to um, uh, be informed about what's happening in your local area, but to also communicate those, um, those issues um, with other um, groups and other people in your, in your region. So wildlife cameras, I'm recycling Alison's picture here. Um, but they do provide a lot of information that you might not necessarily um, uh, pick up um, with the naked eye. So here we can see a fox coming in and um, having some dinner with um, uh, some pet food. Uh, you can get an understanding of um, what native species are being impacted by foxes. Um, and as Brendan um, was speaking about, if you set a camera up on um, a trap, for example, you can get an understanding of fox behavior and it can give you some ideas on how you might um, improve um, your fox management. So what can we do to help you guys? Um, we can create um, accounts because you can create an account in Feral Scan if, if you like, you don't have to. Um, and we can provide you with some instructions on how to use the resource. We offer ongoing um, support. We can send you, which I will be sending you following this um, presentation, um, some resources on um, FOX um, management. Um, and we can also help connect you with um, local groups and local professionals as well. And here's some examples of um, the types of resources that we can send out. So Glove Fox Guide to Managing Foxes is a, one of the staples. It's fantastic. It's very easy to understand and it covers a lot of the um, information that you might uh, require. That's the end of our webinar. I believe that we have a, um, a few questions, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and I will also just share the, whoopsie, um, share the survey link with you all now so that um, we can um, we can get some feedback on um, on what you thought. Let me pop that in the chat. There we go. Um, and there was a question, um, and I think this one might be um, aimed at Brendan. So uh, what was the comment? So we have um, huge amounts of African olive um, and blackberry and a healthy fox population. We were encouraged to pile the African olive for the native animals to breed. Would this contribute to the um, foxes invading our natives? Oh, we are on mute, Brendan. Sorry, asked on mute, that's my bad again. How about that? Yeah, hi. Yeah, great question, Rachel. Uh, no, the thing is, um, if if you're undertaking work such as bush regeneration uh, or weed control, and you're 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 taking away essential habitat for native wildlife, uh, so what you want to do is slowly, slowly, um, strategically remove the weeds, uh, and you want to make small, discrete piles, utilizing that woody debris, because it does does act as um, refuge for native wildlife to hide within and also to forage within. The thing is that when you start getting above knee height with these small discrete piles of woody weeds, they can then um, harbour uh, foxes. So then it works the other way and yeah, not great. You wanna make sure you don't have big dirty stacks of timber lying around the place because that would definitely encourage fox activity. But you're on the right track. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I've just got a question for you, Alison, um, and this might be out of scope for tonight's session, so feel free if we need to um, address this outside of session. Um, but if there are people who are feeding foxes in the local area, do you have any um, comments or advice on um, how to manage those types of situations? Okay, yeah, so as Brendan mentioned, this does come up every now and again. 
Um, so I think that that may need a bit of a um, coordinated media campaign to try and raise the awareness of the issues around feeding foxes. We've, we've noticed in some areas where there might be um, some older, perhaps European type um, people living and they grew up with foxes as natives. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, people who don't even uh, know that foxes don't belong here. So especially in Sydney where there's so many different perspectives and understanding of you know what is native to Australia um, I think yeah probably should talk to um, yeah local council and perhaps LLS to get together and try and do some awareness raising about that sort of issue yeah. thanks Alison um, and oh, I'll just um Sorry, I was popping on mute, Brendan, a bit echoey. Um, I just have um, one question that I would like to know about. Um, in terms of fox diets, um, uh, obviously in peri-urban fringes and more urbanised fringes, um, has there been studies done on um, like increased percentages of um, scrap foods and pet foods in urban areas? Is that, is that I would imagine it would play a major role in um, foxes' diets. Um, but yeah, I'm just wondering um, what the research says about that. Yeah, for sure. So one of the studies that we mentioned before um, by Ben Stepkovich, he found that um, there was a more varied diet in foxes in more urban areas just because they had so much access to, to rubbish. Um, yeah, a, a lot of, um, I guess, smaller mammals as well, rats, mice, etc. cetera. Um, and the urban area, hence, does support a lot of, foxes uh, at a higher density. Um, but he also interestingly found that uh, along that gradient from bush to urban, the foxes in the urban areas were larger generally. So yeah, they're just extremely well-fed, healthy, and unfortunately increasing in density. So hence the, you know, for the, the remaining fauna that we have in Sydney, it's, it's pretty important to try and protect that fauna in those corridors and reserves and, yeah, if um, we all get on board with that idea of the shared responsibility, then uh, the state and local governments are, um, can help to support um, the, the control if it's using the cage traps, for example, as Brendan's gone through tonight. Yeah. Fabulous, yeah, um, thank you for answering that. Um, I think we should wrap that up here. Um, thank you very much, um, Brendan and Alison. Uh, there's been a lot of preparation time that's gone into this evening session, um, as well as the time spent online tonight. So I want to thank you both very much for um, joining us and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Um, everyone, I will send out um, that survey link as well. Um, if you don't have time tonight, but we'd love to hear from you. Um, and I'll also send out some resources. So that link to the um, cage trapping video for foxes, um, I'll send out the glove box guide as well as a few other resources and um, some steps on how to use um, feral scan. So please don't be afraid to get in contact if you have further questions um, and hopefully um, we can all get together and um, work to reduce the impacts of foxes. Um, and thanks for enjoying uh, joining us online this evening. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye.